Uh, welcome everybody. I am a few minutes late getting started. Again, I apologize. I don't know why, but I thought this started at 2.55. And I hope Rich is not too upset with me for this, but we'll get right into it. Um, we can make up some time on skipping some of this stuff at the beginning about who I am. Um, I've been in the IT field since 1996, so I have been around a little bit. And um, I definitely know a bit about HTTP. Uh, I believe my first deployment of Apache Web Server would have been in the uh, late 90s. And uh, it was on a Debian instance that I built uh, from source. Uh, and you might say, well, why did you build Debian from the source? I believe in, the, in 1995 or 96, I only had an ISDN connection, a single channel ISDN connection. Uh, so trying to download a pre-built binary installation or pre-built ISO, they weren't really ISOs at the time, they were more disk images for lobbies. Uh, so I would download source code and build from there. And uh, I built Apache as well. Um, I've been building Apache ever since. I work with it on a daily basis, uh, Apache and Apache Tomcat. Uh, I also work with OpenSSL, although not as much because obviously you don't have to do as much with OpenSSL as you do uh, with Apache and Tomcat. Advertising your products here. Um, so let's get started. Uh, the path is obviously review OpenSSL, review Apache, review PHP, three crucial parts of hardening any dynamic web server setup. Uh, obviously, if you're running a dynamic Java application, you might not have PHP. Uh, you might just have Apache proxying to a Tomcat server. Um, I'm sure you guys can see good. Okay. Um, and to demonstrate this fact, I've created a, a fresh install of uh, CentOS 8, uh, and it has HTTP 2437. That's straight from the Elm repository, which is pretty promising, uh, considering how, uh, how far the repository used to lag in the past. Now, uh, installing CentOS, CentOS 801905, and ending up with a version of uh, Apache that's been released in the last few months is a great thing. It's no longer lagging like it has in the past. Now, if you install CentOS 6, or if you still have uh, a virtual machine that you clone that's uh, version 7, you're gonna be behind the curve, and I would definitely recommend manually upgrading to a newer version. Uh, I believe I checked the 6 repo the other day, I want to say it's on 2.2 still. It might not be. I could be wrong. But I might have installed 2.2 before I ran Yum Update. I think it might have installed 2.2. Um, we don't have time, unfortunately, to go through the CentOS repo and look at those files and determine what is there. But when it comes to securing your environment, uh, avoiding uh, penetration of unwanted users, denial of service, uh, people snooping to steal information. OpenSSL is really at the core of your encryption functionality. Uh, OpenSSL provides encryption, uh, the backbone of encryption for Apache web server, right? The SSL that, uh, the encryption handshake that occurs when you go to an Apache website and it's in HTTPS and it returns a response to your browser, uh, that's encrypted, that communication between you and the server that's encrypted, is encrypted via OpenSSL. Apache does not have encryption on its own. Apache uses uh, OpenSSL to build that encryption. Um, if you are building from the source, uh, so here we have the source of version 2.4.2. If we look at the configure options, You see that one of the configure options is enable SSL, mod SSL. 
and then with SSL directory to point to a directory. Now, SSL can be dynamically typed, uh, dynamically attached, statically compiled into Apache, uh, whatever you choose. But either way, the modules that are built are built using the OpenSSL project. So you have to have both for encryption to work with Apache. If you just build Apache without SSL, there is no encryption functionality. You are not able to use the HTTPS protocol, only the HTTP protocol. So OpenSSL provides that public-private key pair encryption, uh, public key encryption of your data from your website to a client's computer, allowing them to decrypt it and allowing any information that they send to your site to be encrypted. Uh, the versions of OpenSSL up until 2010 were sub 1.98.9.8 and below. Uh, and then in the last 10 years, we've seen an explosion in releases from 1.0.1a all the way to 1.1.1h, uh, I believe, uh, and everything in between. So 1.0.1 and then 1.1.0 and then 1.1.1 and all the minor versions that go along with that. So we've seen a lot more releases in the last 10 years than we saw in the first 10 years of the OpenSSL project. And that's to be expected. It's like many of the open source projects in the 2000s, there was less activity than there is in the 2010s because as the internet has grown and open source projects have grown, community has grown, uh, we see a lot more work being done on these projects. Now, if you're on 0.9.8, you're out of luck. Uh, to get some information about what version of OpenSSL you're running, you can simply run OpenSSL space version, and you can see that the one included with CentOS 8 by default is 1.1.1c. The OpenSSL website is OpenSSL.org. And that's where you can grab the source code to build the latest version, which is three. Uh, you can see that OpenSSL 3 is available. They went straight from OpenSSL 1.1.1 to 3.0 alpha. Now, you might wonder why the big jump. You'd have to really get into the release notes to understand the difference between the encryption engines and the, why the major change. We don't necessarily care because we don't have enough time to get into the differences in OpenSSL versions. Uh, Cyphers-V is a very useful tool if you're trying to um, determine what encryption level to configure for your server or determining what encryption level you're going to allow clients to use. These are the available ciphers with the version of OpenSSL that you have installed. So we have TLS, EG, ECD, EAH, DEH, and EAG and AES, PSK, and a few others. Uh, obviously, PSK is a very popular one, as is AES and uh, DHE. But um, a lot of people will just use the default cipher and they don't uh, change it. Uh, OpenSSL Speed will allow you to benchmark your system and determine how rapidly it can handle encryption and decryption of that data. A heart bleed was a major deal with OpenSSL. If you paid attention to the news, you know you've heard of Heartbleed. Uh, what you, you probably didn't hear was that other than Heartbleed being horrible, which it obviously is, um, it can, Heartbleed allowed uh, malicious users to grab memory buffer data from servers. Um, and as you know, uh, Apache is extremely fast, and a lot of the stuff that it uses, it buffers into memory. Uh, most of the stuff that it serves the clients, it's going to buffer into memory if possible, because buffering stuff into memory is a billion times faster than, not exactly a billion times faster, but it's a lot faster than reading from a disk. Even as fast as NVMe and SSD drives are today, uh, with the PCI Express 4.0 standard, and it still does not compare to DDR4 uh, ECC server RAM running at 3 gigahertz. You just can't compete with that. Uh, but SSDs are getting faster. Either way, it stores a lot in memory. And Heartbleed allows malicious users to access those 
that data that is stored in memory. Uh, and uh, what the news didn't mention was that uh, Heartbleed was discovered in 2010, I believe, and it became mainstream news in 2015. So for five years, it was out in the wild and people were using vulnerable versions uh, in their Apache installation. And it didn't matter uh, what version of Apache Web Server you are necessarily as much as what version of OpenSSL you built your encryption modules with. So if you were using uh, point uh, 1.0.1 point point one and uh, you built your your uh, encryption statically into your Apache software, uh, then you were vulnerable. And a lot of people were vulnerable. Uh, and this was a bad thing. Um, so Vinafi did a scan in 2015 and determined that uh, of the global 2000, Forbes global 2000 companies, more than half a million hosts were vulnerable. And with Heartbleed, you know, all you have to do is uh, download Kali Linux on, you know, spin up a new uh, virtual machine with it, which is as simple as uh, starting up a server. You know, you don't even necessarily have to know anything. You can spin up a new instance of a virtual machine with Kali Linux. You can learn all of this on uh, on YouTube, you know, if you're unfamiliar with how to hack. And you can pretty much point and click your way through exploiting vulnerabilities for certain versions of Apache Web Server, along with a lot of other software. You don't necessarily have to be an expert hacker. The best way to avoid things like this is to stay up on information that will prevent you uh, from having a secure system. Bigger font, please. Uh, when I'm typing or in the slide share. Terminal, got it. Um, <clears throat> now, staying up uh, on everything is going to be very helpful, but uh, you know that's difficult. Uh, at Open Logic, we send out a uh, critical CVE security update notification for free every week, um, where uh, me and a couple other guys on the team we go through bugs that have been released, uh, and we determine what's going to be uh, possibly affecting some of the top open source projects like Apache Web Server, Apache Tomcat, Apache ActiveMQ. And, and how, how that might affect our customers, what you can do to circumvent the problems. Now, that must have been for, for earlier when it said you're muted, right? I assume I'm not muted. Um, so Apache Web Server, now uh, by this point in the conference, if you didn't know what Apache Web Server was coming into it, I'm sure you know now. Uh, but everybody pretty much knows what Apache Web Server is. Even if you don't, uh, if you're not into DevOps or, or software development, you've probably heard of Apache. You know, Apache Software Foundation, ASF, encompasses a number of projects. There's hundreds of projects in ASF, and there's even more in incubation, uh, and they're all Apache projects. But if you hear somebody say Apache, you think Apache Web Server, or at least I do, because for the last 20 years, Apache referred to the Apache web server originally. And while ASF is huge and there's a lot encompassing it, uh, it definitely brings to mind the web server. So Apache web server is a community server that is everywhere. Um, you know, I've read numbers that say 50%, I've read numbers that say 70% of the market, uh, but somewhere between 50 and 100% is where the market share lies for Apache web server. You know people out there are using Nginx, and you know a small number of people are using IIS. Uh, some people are using uh, WebLogic with its web front end or Tomcat passed directly through to the end user by changing ports on it. But a lot of server, billions, literally billions of servers run Apache Web Server. It's very popular. 2.2 was EOL'd in 2017. That's very important to remember. If you take one thing away from this, uh, meeting, it's do not run Apache 2.2. No matter what happens, there's no reason you should be running it. Uh, there's no reason you can't migrate 
anything to 2.4 from 2.4 unless you're running php 3 application which there's no reason you should be running php 3 anything php 4 5 or 7 is going to easily migrate to apache 2.4 probably not even have to make that many changes you don't have to migrate php to migrate apache it's it's uh, it's encapsulated you don't have to migrate anything else you can migrate apache by itself and there's no reason not to even just testing it spinning up a new instance and moving it over is very quick and very easy um so uh on to uh, apache vulnerabilities like uh, zero day vulnerabilities what is a zero day vulnerability that refers to a hold that is known to people in the wild but not to the people that release the software so the committers to the apache project don't necessarily know about something uh, but in the wild it's been released and there's uh, an exploit or there's, there might or might not be an exploit for it. But a zero day attack normally has an exploit that's available um, and it's normally close to the release of a specific version. It's a bad thing. You don't want the words zero day to be associated with your software. Uh, here's some, uh, some uh, old bugs that affected 2.2. Um, uh, although there are a ton of bugs that affect 2.4, don't get me wrong. There are 27 critical exploits for 2.4 right now, ranging from 2.4.1 uh, all the way up to 2.4.37. Um, and you saw that version that I built was, um, let's see, 2.4.2, uh, and another version I built was uh, 2.4. 4.20. Those are two good versions to test exploits with uh, because one's a very early release of 2.4 and one's a middling release of 2.4. Um, testing exploits on the latest version is the last step in testing your exploits because uh, most likely uh, it's been patched. If you're using pre previously published exploits, the latest version of 2.4 is probably patched against those previously published exploits. If you're trying to find your own exploits, it's probably good to start with a more recent version because uh, you, you might discover something that's not been patched or that's not uh, immediately known. Let's see. I believe I have 11 minutes left, just making sure. Um, Options bleed was a uh, bad, a bad issue. But the upside of it was that there was no uh, exploit that was published in the wild. That doesn't mean that there wasn't an exploit for it. But uh, somebody gaining access to your HD access file uh, and changing the permissions of the user, uh, the per file permissions of the user launching your, your Apache instance. Uh, granting secure, uh, elevated privileges that were not originally granted, that's a bad thing. Uh, there were no uh, there were no exploits in the wild for option bleed though. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this is just the top list of my uh, known issues that I've worked with specifically on Apache 2.4. As you can see, there's about 50 of them right there. We're not going to go through those. Um, how do you harden your Apache instance? That's what we really want to concentrate on in the last part of this in the last few minutes. There's a few simple things you can do that will definitely protect you. Uh, I attended the Q&A session with Mark and Chris and a few other people before this. And uh, a lot of the things that I've listed here are things that they mentioned in their, um, in their presentation. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, turn server signature off. You don't want to be displaying information to potential hackers. If you throw an error, uh, yes, it's very helpful to see the error and as much information about the error and the environment and the conditions at the time of the error. And if your customer can see that, then they can say, well, I've got this error and this is the data that I put into it. This is the data that I got out. And that's great. That's very helpful for debugging problems and uh, making your, your application better. But that's horrible from a hacking perspective because if you're a security perspective, because by 
allowing your stack traces to be out there, allowing your server information to be out there, you are opening yourself up to all kinds of things that you wouldn't necessarily open yourself up to uh, if that information wasn't there. You don't want to publish what version of software you're using for your internet platforms to the internet. There is no reason to publish that information. A lot of servers do it by default. You don't want to do it if you can avoid it. Uh, that server I just started up a minute. This is the root app of Apache Tomcat. It's for production. But if you deployed this in production and dropped your container, your application into this container, uh, as you know, you've got a portal application. So to get to the application, you go to slash portal, uh, and you didn't make your application the root application or change the context file of your application to reroute uh, root application request to your application, and you left the root war in there, then you've published what version of Apache you're, you're, you're using. You've also published all kinds of information that you don't even think of, just uh, uh, coincidental information. I don't know what I'm doing because I published the root web application to the internet on this server. That's a bad, bad idea, right? You don't want to do that. Turn off directory listings, check for unused modules, use users and groups. Those are all very simple things to do. You don't want to have a bunch of modules that you're not using. Some Apache configurations, when you build it, as you see here, there's an option. to have all modules compiled into the application and all modules enabled. And some people do that, but there's 50, 60, 70 modules there. You know, maybe not that many. There's a lot of modules. There's a lot of modules and, you know, uh, let's see, mod deflate has known exploits that affect it. You can Google how to exploit mod deflate. And if you have mod deflate enabled, even though you're not necessarily using it, that's just exposing yourself to vulnerabilities for no reason. There's no reason to include dependencies that you don't need. You can disable them very easily. Some other things that are very simple to do, install mod security. That is an excellent one right there. If you look at my module directory, um, no, no mod security here. Um, this is my default install. This is not the install I built. It's a little more complicated with the install you built. But if you just installed uh, Apache Web Server, I believe it's uh, mod security. Underscore. All you have to do is do this. After you have Apache installed, or if you installed Apache before, there's no reason why you can't just run yum install mod security. Now, if you have specialized CGI scripts, if you have specialized PHP applications, you might have issues without changing the default configuration. But if you just have a static web application, or if you're proxying to a Tomcat server, there's no reason you can't start with the default mod security settings. And now if you look in the HTTPD folder, there is a mod security D folder now. And inside there, there's activated rules, local rules, there's all kinds of examples. Uh, it's a good place to start from adding an extra layer of security to your web server without having to have a lot of knowledge about necessarily configuring your web server. This is on CentOS. I use Yum to install it, but if you were on Apache, uh, on Ubuntu, you could do something like app git install uh, mod security uh, or, you know, app cache, uh, app cache search mod security, something like that. Now, if you're on Debian, you could use a package tool or you could use uh, the Debian package manager. You could download an RPM and do RPM IDH to install verbose a uh, file that you downloaded, the RPM file that you downloaded from the web. Uh, there's a million ways to do it, and it's very simple. There's no reason you shouldn't do it. Mod Evasive is another one. It's a little bit harder to get your hands on. You might have to add a repo 
you might have to uh, build it from the source. Uh, I recommend building Apache Web Server from the source. I recommend building Mod Security from the source and Mod Evasive from the source. But that's only because I've been doing it for so long that uh, it's very second nature to me. I've built it and I've gone through all the problems that you have with building, so I know pretty quickly, uh, hey, you know, GCC doesn't have the C++ extensions installed, so we need to reinstall GCC C++ extensions on this kind of failure. But I can see why it would be daunting so if you haven't built it before. Um, so, you know, I would always recommend uh, go to outside help. This is an open source community. There's no reason why somebody won't help you do this. Uh, you shouldn't just settle for the default configuration with your own custom build. You can have no modules at all built into it. You can have only the SSL encryption that you want built into it. Um, and you can, you can fine tune and control your, your exposure to the web much easier. Uh, the web is your friend. Google things like hardening Apache Web Server. Um, I'll put these slides up there. There are some uh, common exploits, and the notes on this slide have a lot of things. You can see some notes in this slide. There are some ways to say, here's the build for PHP. There's a lot of helpful stuff in the notes on these slides. Uh, that teach you how to harden PHP, how to harden Apache, and how to harden OpenSSL, although there's not much you can do with SSL. I think I have two minutes left. Does anybody have any questions uh, before we uh, end this? I think I'm starting to lose my voice. I've been talking a lot this week. I apologize that we wasted the first nine minutes of the session. I did not mean to do that. Uh, if you are on the um, on the Slack, I will post them. And Christopher Schultz, I believe, is uploading them all to SlideShare. Um, but uh, I will post a message in the ACP Track channel on Slack. Any other questions? I really appreciate your time, guys. Uh, it's been a great session so far. The Open Logic booth is available as well. Uh, that's where I work, and we have uh, lots of consulting opportunities. Uh, you know, I'm not on the sales team, but you can talk to the people that are on the sales team in the Open Logic booth under um, the expo link, I believe. If you go there, we have people from the marketing department and the sales department that will offer uh, help on getting set up with working with us and working with deploying HTTP server. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.